This is John Amis talking about music from East Anglia, a hundred miles northeast of London, on the crumbling flat coast where the composer Benjamin Britten was born and lived out most of his life. The sound of water permeates much of his music. The sea dominates life in these parts. early dawn music from his first and overwhelming operatic success, Peter Grimes. It not only put Great Britain on the operatic map, but Benjamin Britten too. Interest in that opera and Britain led him to make a music festival in the borough where Peter Grimes lived and where Benjamin Britten himself later lived. And that's exactly where we are today, not only in Albra, but even in Britain's house, in his music room converted barn, and you can see here the accumulated artistic luggage of a lifetime. Paintings by Sickert, D'Souza, John Piper and Stanley Spencer, sculpture by Rodin and Henry Moore, books and scores, scores and books. His lifelong companion, the tenor Peter Pears, still lives on in the house, but there is much to remind one of the composer. When Britain died in 1976 at the age of 63, there was an opportunity that Donald Mitchell, critic, writer, Britain's publisher and executor, was quick to seize. Here was a chance to keep all these manuscripts together in the environment where Britain had worked and lived and worked for over 30 years at Albra. This must be one of the most comprehensive and finest collection of a composer's manuscripts, a composer of any importance, in the Western world. Everything, really, that fed into his life mm. was in this one spot. You see his concert grand piano behind you. Yes. And um, his conducting scores, his piano music, his poetry books, a good many of which, of course, were used in writing works um, with texts. You'll find that there are marked passages. I always think myself that it's not the verses he put in, but the verses he left out, which are the interesting ones. <laughs> Our greatest treasure is, in fact, the manuscript of Peter Grimes, the composition sketch of Peter Grimes, which Britain had given to the conductor of the work, Reginald Goodall, after its first performance. Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes, Peter Grimes. Peter Grimes, we are here to investigate the cause of death of your apprentice, William Spold, whose body you brought ashore from the boat of old Billy on the 26th Altimo. Do you wish to get evidence? Will you step into the box? Here's Rosamond Strode again. She was once one of Britain's amanuenses. She's now the librarian of what is called the Britain Pears Foundation. And the first thing we looked at together was their greatest treasure of all. Reginald Goodall, who conducted the premiere of Peter Grimes, recently found the score in a cupboard at his house, and he gave it back to the library. This is the composition sketch. I'll read the inscription. Mm -hmm. For Reginald Goodall a souvenir of his splendid work and great understanding at the first performance, June the 7th, 1945, signed Benjamin Britten. And you'll see that it's rather a battered-looking manuscript. It certainly is. It's uh, been travelling about a good deal. When he was writing this, which was during the latter part of the war, uh, he never let it away from his side, and the manuscript always travelled with him. So this, and the fact that he must have played off it many times, accounts for some, but not all, of the rather battered look that it has. Because mm. I remember very well, he was the most marvellous pianist. Uh, um, he played in such an orchestral yes, way, Yes, he did. He? I think anybody who ever heard him play one of his own new works for the first time has never forgotten the experience. It was the most mm. thrilling thing. He couldn't sing, really, if you'll remember, John. Yeah. But uh, 
he could give the impression of singing nearly all the parts somehow. Yeah. It was amazing. Interesting that he, he puts in phrase marks and things like that. It's complete, really. He puts the whole thing in, and the voice parts are really are complete. Uh, it mattered terribly. Of course it does. I, the, the phrases and the little stresses and things are such an essential part of music. Hmm. But it's interesting to see part. that his, his yes. brain worked yes. that way. Incredible yeah, professionalism. Actually, yes, it's actually part of the music. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. There's a little interpolation there. Hmm. We go to the pub scene, have a look at the uh, end of the storm. The storm section had to be extended, uh, but to provide a minute and a half more for the, for the stage. Well, you know, there's one bit that I always wonder if it was added afterwards, and I wonder if it well, is. Well, I, I don't believe that anybody can really know where it came. You really? can't even work it out from the, man, from the manuscript. But you know, this is the very bit that I always well, found a little bit doubtful. That's him. That's the original bit. That's the original bit. It's the squall yeah. bit, you know. Yes. No, that was always in. Oh, that was just always just in. Just in a different place. Uh -huh. But uh, I'm not saying you didn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the end of it, with the whole orchestra screaming downhill into a one chord and nothing. Straight into the, into the pub scene. It's extraordinary. Looks wonderful. Britain based the opera on George Crabbe's early 19th century poem, The Borough. Now, Peter Grimes is no ordinary hero or villain, and a contemporary British opera on such a subject, after all, several of the boy apprentices do get killed, all seemed an unlikely choice to reopen a London opera house, Sadler's Wells, after the Second World War. There's one of those legendary stories that everybody at Sadler's Wells wanted to reopen with Merry England. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, um... I, uh, and they got Peter Grimes instead. My guess is that a, that a fair number of the cast and the administration of the, of, the, of the Opera House really probably thought Peter Grimes, A, was a very, very depressing story, and of course it was a, and is a pessimistic work, and also perhaps represented what so many of them thought was rather nasty modern uh, music. And so the work was brought to first performance in an atmosphere, I think, of... of in some respects, considerable tension. The other thing, of course, that there is with the sadistic fisherman, you know, ill-treating his boys, there was a sus suspicion of homosexuality, or more than a suspicion, which, of course, was rather rare in those days, and so it was against the sort of social mores. I mean, I can remember <laughs> there was a story of a 38 bus conductor saying, uh, here we are, Sadler's Wells, any more for Peter Grimes, a sadistic fisherman? That actually happened, I believe. Of course, it's become rather fashionable now, as you probably know, to read P Peter Grimes as a kind of parable of the predicament of, uh, of homosexuals, of gay people uh, in uh, the 30s and, and, and 40s, and so that Peter Grimes itself is a kind of interpretation uh, of the plight of the homosexual uh, in, in our society at that time. I think, honestly, that that can be rather over, overdone. Oh, yes. I, th I think it, it, it diminishes a, a great composer and, and someone also who was a passionate um, pacifist. And uh, I think we have to be very cautious how we psychoanalyze uh, an artist's work. A work is sometimes quite different from and should be kept separate from the artist himself. Despite the worldwide success of the grand opera, Peter Grimes, Britain changed tack, and his next two operas were chamber ones, suitable for more modest venues. Indeed, they gave him the idea of founding a festival right here in Albra. It's a charming little unspoiled town. Crabb described the borough, where all presented to the eye or ear oppressed the soul with misery, grief and fear. 
Well, that may have been what it was really like in Crabbe's time, or it may have been artistic licence. But in the second half of the 20th century, Albury's a beguiling, higgledy-piggledy Victorian mix of fishermen's cottages and burghers' houses, lots of pastel colours, clinker-built fishing boats on the beach, even though actual fisher folk are outnumbered by retired people, and at festival time, music lovers and musicians. Amongst the latter, composer Oliver Nusson is prominent, and not just because he's six foot four and rather generously built. He's a director of the festival, as well as being a conductor here of new works by himself and many others. I caught him fresh from a rather frustrating rehearsal. Nobody cares about new pieces these days. A uh, bitter remark by the composer. It's true. I mean, there's no... Well, I mean, who's written a Leningrad symphony or a concerto for... Austria? True. This is, this is also true, but on the other hand, there's no... There's Critique n- being nasty. No, no, no. <clears throat> Me- mechanism of any new orchestral piece going into a standard repertoire. Some kind of a, sta- a central orchestral repertoire doesn't exist anymore. No. At all. Composers have a very tough time these days from that point of view, although they probably get more commissions and more professional performances, larger numbers of them do than ever before, but it doesn't go to, it doesn't lead to anything. That's, the, that's what they're writing for. It's the beginning and the end. Not that Oliver Nusson was talking especially there about himself. His own works get considerably aired and prepared, both here and in the United States. He first hit the public as a teenager when he conducted his first symphony in London in the Royal Festival Hall. Ollie knows a fantastic amount of music. He's a voracious listener and score reader, which is ideal for a festival director. He advises Albrecht about new music. Ollie often went to Tanglewood in the States, and he met Morris Sendak, and they collaborated together on a little opera, Where the Wild Things Are, which was a great success at Glyndebourne and on TV. After the frustrations of the day at Albrecht, I asked Ollie which were the works of his that he liked the best. Well, I've got a very soft spot for, for where the wild things are simply because I took so damned long on it and, and I know it now so well as a performer. Mm. Um, I mean, a lot of people think that your third symphony is, is one of your best pieces. I would that? agree with that, yes. And that, again, that's a piece which did I did finally allow to take the time it needed. Uh, how long was that? It took five years and it's only a quarter of an hour. The first time I remember you was when you shambled on like a sort of uh, reconstituted Vaughan Williams to conduct, <laughs> well, the size and the shape of you, if I may say so. Oh, well, that's all right. Um, you came, you were 17, I think, and you conducted your first symphony. I hate to tell you, I was 15. God, it's it true. Disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go into that. And then you went to the States for a long time, didn't you? Well, there was a big, uh, you know, as happens when people of about 15 or something do things, there's a there's a big brouhaha. Is that the word? Yeah, brouhaha. And and, uh, and there was a newspaper man waiting outside the, the, the you know, my mum was sort of, there would be a knock on the door and we'd think it was the postman. Mum would open, can we have a picture for this while he's asleep in bed and all this kind of thing. I thought, well, getting away from all this. So I simply went, I had an American grandmother. So I tore off to Chicago and just lived there for two months, three months, until it all died down, which it duly did. And uh, at that point, I started really getting very interested in, in American music. In the States, there is just a gigantic amount of... It, the numbers are enormous. Let me ask you a question. Guess how many composers it has been estimated there are in New York? Well, I don't know. I was astonished when I found out how many symphony orchestras are. Yeah. There's something like a thousand symphony orchestras in America. In the States. So there must be about 5,000 composers in the States. No, there's about, apparently about 20,000 composers <laughs> in the States, and there are 1,000 in New York, serious composers. 1,000. How many of them have got a publisher? About 10. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, you see. What's your Aubrey 1985 piece? Music for a puppet court. It was a set of arrangements of, of 16th century puzzle canons from a book found in the reign of Henry VIII 
and somebody found the solutions in the 50s, and they're rather interesting. The Puzzle Cannon, by the way, is, is <clears throat> a piece of music for multiple voices, in this case four, in which one of the parts isn't given, and you're given a clue at the bottom of the page, which should lead you to be able to fill in what the missing notes are, or the clue in one of the cases was four descending notes with the word trice, which they found out was the Greek for thrice, and these four notes are played three times three times, getting faster and faster and faster. They're really quite intriguing. And uh, I wrote both an arrangement of these pieces for a small instrumental ensemble, and then two pieces based on the material. <laughs> Whilst new music does certainly get a hearing at Alborough, most of the repertoire is, of course, older. And most of the concerts take place in the maltings in Snape, five miles away from Alborough. It's a converted malt house. And when you go out in the interval of a concert, there's a river hard by, with little sailing barges and ships, then reeds, river, estuary and marshes stretching away, with land and seabirds galore animating the scene. But there's more to Snape than a pretty setting, as artists will tell you, like Shmuel Ashkenazi, the leader of the 1985 string quartet in residence, the Vermeer. We were very gratified that the, the Snape concert hall has very fine acoustics. Mm. They are both warm, rich and quite clear. Mia String Quartet playing the opening of Mozart's Dissonance Quartet. Their programmes at Alborough range from that to Schubert and to Berg's Lyric Suite via Dvorak's Quintet with Murray Pariah at the piano. He's another festival director, by the way. Ashkenazi and Pariah grew up together in New York, and talking with the violinist, I put it to him that many of the younger quartets can play the moderns all right, but they come unstuck when it comes to Haydn and Mozart. I feel that also with the older generation. All of us uh, have our very, very great difficulties with the Mozart Quartet and Haydn. It's a question of... Well, it's a question of uh, very few notes and so much music expressed in them. And there is very little range of expression. If you play it a little bit strictly, it sounds deadly boring. And if you touch it, you spoil it. It makes it very difficult. You feel in a straitjacket, and the minute you do, it sounds deadly. Mm. Do you find it very difficult to balance something like the Berg Lyric Suite? Actually, the Berg uh, and all the, the Viennese school is rather easy to balance because he spoon-feeds you. Uh, those scores are so terribly overmarked that you cannot go wrong if you're faithful. Mm. If anything, you have to disobey the, their instructions a little bit in order for the score to be heard. Uh, for the string player, and for string quartet in particular, I think a big part of the balance is the possibility to use the bow pressure and speed in a different way in order to have clarity. If two different elements of the music are expressed with the same bow pressure and speed, then they cover each other, as it were. They don't have the distinction that in the orchestra a nobo and a bassoon would have, or a nobo and a, even a clarinet would have. So the string player can do that, and also by varying the vibratos. It's very easy to have a differentiation between the high violin and the viola or cello, but when the two violins play near each other, then it becomes intrusive. One is intruding upon the other, and if uh, 
if the players are sensitive to it, they can, by mutual agreement and a decision, uh, change the quality of sound so that one may be a little more, be more penetrating, the other a little rounder. This is a great part of, of uh, balancing. Listening, listening. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. of Schubert's Death and the Maiden Quartet. Another piece that the Vermeer played was Dover Beach, a setting of Matthew Arnold's poem by the American composer Samuel Barber, written for quartet and baritone. This solo baritone part was sung by another festival director, as it happens, John Shirley Quirk. He is one of our most distinguished singers, a consummate musician, and with that prerequisite of a world artist, a beautiful timbre that can be immediately recognised, whether he's singing opera, oratorio, or a sea shanty. John Shirley Quirk singing the opening of Percy Granger's shanty, Shala Brown. The conductor, Benjamin Britten himself. Britten tailored two of his last important baritone operatic parts for John Shirley Quirk in Owen Wingrave and Death in Venice. John had started off as a chemistry teacher, then he turned singer and never looked back. Festivals, proms, concerts, operas, here and all over the world. But perhaps he was never so busy on stage as when, in 1973, he played all seven parts of that composite villain, the Traveller, who hounds the writer hero Aschenbach to his death in Venice. I remember the first time that Britain talked to me about the characters, and I saw the character on the uh, the the, um, the old man on the boat, the the, the the fop on the boat, and I thought, I can't, I can't do that. There's no way I can I can I can portray that that character. That, I mean that. Oh oh no, I couldn't do it. The, the fop sings really very high, high falsetto. Yes. He heard my singing such notes in um, a recording of the St John Passion, the Bach, when the tenor who were singing the arias, Robert Teer, was not present. But they wanted to rehearse the thing. So I sang, <laughs> in my best falsetto, I sang the high, these very high tenor parts. That was when he heard me sing these, this sort of, of uh, sound, and he kept it in his mind and then finally wrote it in Death and Venice. Amazing. That's, that is amazing. It's, it's beautiful. And it's perfect, of course, for that particular for character. That particular character is absolutely marvellous. Were the things that you didn't sing that you would like to have sung? I mean, you didn't sing a great deal of, of Verdi or Puccini or anything like that. Yes, I think that was intentional. I think I realised quite early on that if, I, in order to sing Verdi well, I would have to rethink my basic vocal technique. To what extent? 
the Italian technique is a much more open-throated one than the German or English singing technique. At the top of the voice, for example, for me, say, E-flat, E-natural, F, the German technique would tend to cover those notes. That means going into more of a head voice than the Italian technique ever would. With the Italian singing, it's really, to be vulgar about it, it's balls all the way, isn't it? That's right, that's right. It's, it's balls right up to the top, and that's, that is what is so thrilling about it. Yes. But to do that, I, I, I mean, it, it just terrifies me, mm. the idea of opening an F. Now, occasionally, I get very close to opening an F for a special effect, but I come away from it as quick as I can. <laughs> <laughs> out, of, out of fear. Yes. Whereas if I were singing Italian, an, an, an Italian baritone role, I would, I would certainly have to open an F yes. all the time. The whole thing is more athletic, more robust. Yes, yes. And whereas you're, as a, as a leader singer in an oratorio, in the German style and the French style, it's more subtle. You're always well, trying to... Well, we like to think so. Yes. <laughs> well, it really is. It is more subtle, but actually when you come to hear some, some of these beautiful old singers, I mean, for example, Tauber, who sang Lieder with this wonderful Italian technique, and it, sound, it sounds beautifully in Italian and open, and yet it is so subtle. There are people who can, who can bridge that, uh, yeah. that gap. I'm, I'm a bit too afraid of it, I'm afraid. John Shirley Quirk, a very great artist indeed. When you come to think about it, Britain left a legacy beyond the music he composed and the festival he fostered. He left behind him many artists that he'd worked with. Artists like Piers, Baker, Fischer Dieskau, Shirley Quirk, Vishnevskaya, Rostropovich, Pariah, Bream, the Amadeus Quartet, the English Chamber Orchestra. All these have acknowledged the tremendous musical benefit they had from working with Britain on his and other music. His music is still played, of course, at Albra, but he doesn't dominate the scene, as any new work did in the past. Such works of his as still turn up are some he hoped had been forgotten, but some that had actually completely disappeared from his recollections. Until he was confronted with his own manuscript score of the American Overture, played at Albra in 1984, he actually denied ever having composed such a piece. It's perfectly true, but um, it's indisputably in his own handwriting. Yeah. And, in fact, we, we all know it's by him. He just had forgotten it. He wasn't at all well at this time, and I think it was just one of those kind of mental blocks that people do set up sometimes yeah. where uh, there's an unhappy period in their life and they prefer to forget yeah. uh, what's gone on there. Yeah. But apparently when he was first asked about it, he said, no, it didn't exist. No, he didn't remember it. It's quite true. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Yes, because it's a big piece. Thank you. 